Daryl Gebbian joins us now with the uh, subject of a harrowing account in McLean's magazine of drug addiction. And, of course, it's all about fentanyl, which we've talked about a great deal on the show. Daryl, it's, it's nice to have you. Nice to have you tell your story. Oh, thanks for having me. Uh, I guess people shouldn't be surprised at your profession or the fact that you're a professional. I mean, anybody can fall into addiction. But I guess a lot of people would think with everything you went through to get that medical degree, to get that high-firing career, how does a guy like you end up addicted to fentanyl? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's a long story, but it has to do... Like, an addiction doesn't just take place in a vacuum. There's many small steps that get you there to the point of desperation and, and doing silly things where you're a slave to the drug. It's a series of bad decisions. It starts with back pain, uh, being prescribed Percocet. I used the prescription appropriately for about a year, but then, you know, as the, as the back pain got worse, I started relying more and more on the, on the Percocet. I had a lot of personal problems, marital issues, uh, isolation because I moved up to Barrie, uh, no longer talking to my friends, uh, discord with my parents, and I started really relying on the medication kind of to treat my, not just my physical pain, but the emotional pain. More than anybody else, though, being a doctor, I guess, I mean, you kind of knew the gamble you were taking and, and what you were doing to your body. So was that sort of a subroutine running in your head for you, thinking, man, this is a bad idea, but I'm going to do it anyway? <laughs> you think, you know, uh, your doctor, you should know better. But it is such a sneaky drug, uh, opiates in general, but in this case, Percocet, that you don't know where you're when you've reached this tipping point where you've taken mm -hmm. enough that it starts putting you into a withdrawal syndrome when you don't take it. Like you don't know when that moment is. And there's a day I woke up and I was really irritable and cranky and um, I couldn't understand what was going on. Like, well, why am I feeling this way? It's totally new to me. And then later that evening, I took another Percocet and the symptoms went away. And then then it, then it dawned on me. It's like, holy crow, this is a uh, this is what withdrawal is, but you don't know that you're getting to that point. So, no, as a physician, like what you're taught in books and what you learn about it is like it's not enough. Um, when it's the real life situation with a drug that is so sneaky, like this is, it creeps up on you, it gets you deeper and deeper, you build a tolerance uh, to achieve the same effect. So, you're you need more and more of the medication to achieve the same effect, and it just ends up that's the beginning of how, how destructive it can be. And of course, quite frequently, uh, people will show up in an emergency ward, which is where you were working, you know, on drugs or on booze. What kind of disconnect was it for you to stare at these people and treat these people while, you know, for example, wearing a fentanyl patch? <laughs> uh, I, can, I can relate to people, and I think that's an important feature for emergency physicians, that we need to relate to people to all walks of life. It's totally ironic that yeah, like I was fighting my own demons and in a growing addiction, and yet I'm treating people uh, with other addictions. But it, in fact, made me more understanding and uh, more provide more humane care. Before the, this happened to me, though, I mean, it's I think it's uh, the uh, matter of the poor education for physicians and nurses. Uh, there's there seems to be a disconnect there, and um, people who do have an addiction are kind of treated in a different sort of way. I mean, if they're going through a rough time, there's lots of compassion, but sometimes when a person came in for abdominal pain, but they would identify themselves as a recovering addict, they would get a different quality of different standard of care. And that is something that I'm really uh, upset about. I was like that way, you know, before I came through it and I, my own addiction. And I realized that that's something that needs to be fixed. It's just that the, Healthcare professionals don't really understand it. And when we don't understand something, we tend to get defensive and our backs up. Um, and that's something that, you know, I'm hoping someday, like once my whole ordeal is over, that I really want to help educate healthcare professionals into understanding addiction better. Yeah, well, with everything that's going on these days with fentanyl, both the legal and illegal and other opiates or opioids, I guess, um, I mean, do you blame anything or anyone in all of this or do you say no it's all on me well we have to look at the history of fentanyl fentanyl started off as an intravenous drug form in the hospital and it's an excellent medication used for acute pain and for sedation that's that's what it was originally meant for and then it came out as a patch transdermal patch and it was excellent the idea you know it really is a good idea it's a safe medication to take as long as it's taken appropriately there's nothing wrong with it uh if it's used properly it's just that someone along the line discovered 
and this is now in keeping with how OxyContin had changed their form, uh, the formula so that it could not be abused anymore. So people on the street switched from the OxyContin to the next best choice, and someone had discovered along the way that a fentanyl patch could be abused. And that's where the issue is. I don't blame the, the pharmaceutical industry. That was not what they intended. So as far as myself goes and my addiction, I mean, I am squarely to blame. It has nothing to do with the medications. The addiction resides in me. I'm the one who chose to abuse what was out there, in my case, Percocet and fentanyl. And so I take full responsibility for that. That is my fault. And it can honestly be said, I mean, you've pretty well lost it all. I mean, you sound okay, and I know you're sort of picking yourself up, but, I mean, your marriage, your profession, all of it. Yeah, you know, something weird happens when you lose what you think is important, and then suddenly there's a lot of clarity. And it, it, you know, i got to say, it took me a long time to get to this point. It's been two years now, but the hardest part is, I, I think, the, the separation with my children. I realize now what are the most important things in life, and, and that is, you know, to be honest, to have communication with other people. It's relationships with people that that's what got me through this nightmare. And, and I realized that's where happiness resides. It's not monetary gain or uh, objects that we think are important. It's unfortunate, yes, my marriage um, ended because of this, but we still talk. Um, it's amicable. My children are happy. They have a roof over their heads. I have a roof over my head, and I'll I'll get back there, you know. So that's why I, you know, I want to carry this message of hope to other people, because I remember not too long ago, it's a very dark place when I'm deceiving people and lying and in denial. It's an ugly, ugly situation being in jail, you know. I needed a swift kick in the rear, really, to, to I, don't, I was going to die. I mean, so by being, being pulled aside at work, by being arrested, by going to jail, by going through rehab, by losing so many things, I really... Uh, you know, there's something positive to gain from it. I know that sounds totally crazy. Do you think you're done with drugs for good? Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> the gift of desperation is what they call it in, in recovery. And, uh, I mean, fentanyl is so destructive. It kicked my rear end. And the, the just, just recalling the withdrawal syndrome, the detox I went through, was horrifying. Like, petrifi petrifying is an understatement of what I went through. And that is a very firm deterrent to ever uh, slipping back. And what I've learned really, I mean, I did have a couple of flips. And what I learned with each time is it's a one-way street. It just it leads to the same old negative, ugly swamp of despair. And, I, and, and it's just one way. It's going to lead me to jails, institutions, or death. And it just took time for me to realize that and realize that I'm not the full me. I'm so much I'm so much better of a person. The full me is there when I'm clean and sober. If I'm lucky enough to practice medicine again, I'll be engaging in a um, monitoring contract where it's very, um, uh, where they, they check random urines. Uh, I'm doing everything else already. I have a good, I have a very good aftercare program just quickly here. Just, uh, you know, I, I go to 12 step meetings. I go to an aftercare group, which is where you're with other um, recovering people. I go to a caduceus group, which is recovering uh, healthcare professionals. And I look forward to the day uh, when I can start um, giving back again as a physician, if I'm lucky. You know, we'll see how that goes. Thanks a lot for this. Appreciate your honesty. You're welcome. I, you know, the purpose is I really, it's true to my heart. I want to help people who are in that despair. The best thing of coming out and talking about it is just to let people you're not alone there's others like us who've gone through it it's painful yes but we are here for you our arms are open the matter of you making that decision to come to us and we'll help you